Can you all hear me okay in the back? Well, uh, thanks for battling the storm apocalypse 2023 to be here with us this evening and welcome to a celebration of literature and living writers. My name is Megan Marshall. I'm the director of the Hugh C. Hyde Living Writers Series. And tonight's author is an esteemed SDSU MFA program alum. You're actually in the same cohort together, which I'm like feeling kind of old, not that you are, but I am yeah, <laughs> reminiscing a little bit about the, those, those good old days. Um, so this is sort of like a, a homecoming event for him tonight. So very excited to have you all here to join us. Um, before I welcome him up to the podium, I do wanna thank those folks who have helped to make this series possible. And that includes all of our friends here at Love Library, my fabulous co-host, Markle Tumlin, holding it down in the back. And also, I want to thank Zanya Luca Hall, Laura Bliss, and Rebecca Williamson, in addition to the Department of English and Comparative Literature and Instructionally Related Activities for their continued support of our events. And lastly, I am humbled to acknowledge this space that we are privileged to share. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations. And as members of the San Diego State University community, we acknowledge this legacy. Just a few final reminders. If you haven't done so already, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. And uh, know that this event is being recorded, but don't worry. All we see is this, essentially. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our featured reader. Andrew Kelly Stewart is an author, editor, writing coach, and professor. His writing spans the literary, science fiction, fantasy, and the supernatural genres. His short fiction has appeared in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Ziziva, and Juxtaprose, among other journals. And his debut book, We Shall Sing a Song Into the Deep, which we'll be sharing from this evening, is available from the prestigious publisher of sci-fi and fantasy, Tor.com. And he's also slanging copies tonight. So if anybody wants to get one, yes, you'll be able to purchase that after the reading today. Um, he lives and writes locally in San Marcos here in San Diego. We Shall Sing a Song into the Deep has been lauded as a parable of paranoia, twisty, claustrophobic, haunting, and strangely beautiful. A study of people under pressure, filled with heart and soul, hope and music, and a bracing examination of humanity's weaknesses and strengths. But what I believe makes Andy's work so compelling and essential is his unique ability to question the constrictions of belief and the dangers inherent in the conflation of faith and fact, which connects powerfully with our current moment. In prose that reads like poetry, readers follow brave protagonist Remy as she struggles with identity, purpose, duty, and the fate of the strange world that she's been reborn into. While the novel does not provide any neat resolution, perhaps a wonderful subversion of that pesky freight hog triangle, it does explore the necessity of resilience, the stubborn optimism of will, and ultimately the power of song, not necessarily maybe to change the world, but to help us mitigate tragedy. So please join me and welcome me, Andy Stewart. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, wow, this is a, uh... Uh, there are more of these than I thought there would be. Um, so that's really exciting to look out here and see this. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I kind of wrote down just a few notes, a few opening comments that I, I can tend to ramble sometimes if I'm not reading from the page. So you'll forgive me if I'm reading a little bit here. But uh, I, I just wanted to thank you so much, uh, Megan and the Living Writer Series for inviting me to read tonight. Um, and thanks to Stephen Paul Martin, of course, for reaching out to me about this opportunity. It's just a real pleasure to be here. Indeed, I am a proud alum of SDSU's Master's Program in Creative Writing. I was, uh, it was in 10, 2010, um, so over a decade ago, that I last stood here. Maybe not in this exact room, but certainly here in the Love Library. Um, taking part in the end of semester uh, graduate reading event uh, that I guess you still hold those every year. Is that still happens over here? Um, I read that night from my master's thesis a sci fi noir pastiche novel that uh, my advisor, Stephen Paul, uh, so patiently shepherded me through. Um, after graduation, 
inspired and self-confident, I bulked up that manuscript from about 50,000 words to 70 or so. And I started sending it out to agents. Um, around 70 agents or so uh, later, um, I told you I was a very self-confident writer then, uh, that, uh, that book did not sell. Um, and really it's for the better it didn't because truly it wasn't very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, that book did set me on a path. I got my first agent based off a, um, a kind rejection from that first terrible book. Um, and with a new book in hand and a fancy agent by my side, um, surely a sweet publishing deal was just around the corner for me. Um, let me just save us some time. I have many unpublished novels and pieces of fiction that are uh, gathering dust on the shelf. Um, but all of that led, finally, all of those pieces, all that writing led to uh, this humble piece, um, finding a home with the publisher of my dreams. Um, I learned so much from my time at SDSU, working with instructors such as Stephen Paul Martin, uh, David Matlin, um, who's since retired, Joanna Sherry, who's since retired, Ilya Kaminsky, the inimitable Ilya Kaminsky, who's, who's moved on. Um, these were so inspirational, these, these, these instructors are so inspirational with, for my work. And standing here right now, it does truly feel like I've come full circle. Um, and so I really am thrilled to be standing here. It means a lot to me to be here and thank you again for, for, um, for coming. Um, so I'm gonna be reading some tonight from my debut uh, book. It's technically a novella, if we wanna think about word count, but, uh, and I talked to my agent about this, or my editor about this, and I was like, okay, so technically it's a novella, but can I still like, when I'm bragging about it, can I still call it a book? And she's like, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, so it's my book, it's my debut book. Um, and uh, if, if some of you, I know many of you, or some of you have read this already, uh, for those who haven't, we shall sing in the, a song into the deep follows Remy, who is a chorister that is a singer in this mona monastically inspired um, situation, a, as a matter of fact, a Christo fascist cult that roams the uh, post-nuclear war, sees uh, marauding and, and taking what they will. Um, and uh, Remy does her best um, to survive that and, and try to embrace some light during all of that. Um, so I'll actually be reading a few passages from, um, from this, just from the opening of this. And actually a little surprise, a, uh, a bit from the cutting room floor of this book, which I think uh, might be fun to share. And then also a little bit of um, a new piece that I've been working on. Peel resounds through the boat, through the frame of my bunk. I feel it in my jaw, my teeth, reverberation. And again, Brother Silas knocking the rusty-headed mallet against the hull. The boat is a bell, three deep resonating tolls, waver and fade, call to matins, the night office. The compartment pitches downward, weight shifts, cold toes tingle, alive. The deepest dive of the day, 100 fathoms. Bodies turn roused from first sleep. Old metal springs plink. Sleepy shapes roll languidly from their bunks. I know them all, even in the dimness. Laszlo, lean and short but strong. Caleb, mousy and frail. St. John with his large, knobby head and tall, soft padding Ephraim. Stifled coughs, no talking. Silence is observed, must be. I follow, though my belly aches to move. More than hunger, I worry for I know those pangs as I know my hands. Something else, a two-day malady thus far, but I move, climb down from my bunk, stacked third highest. My toes know their purchase, salt corroded frames, great graded death. We don our gunny sack, our gunny sack robes in this perennial dusk. One sculpin oil lamp hangs at a tilt from the forward birthing bulkhead. Fat gummed glass, sputter and fishy reek. In a line, we work our way aft up the main corridor at a slant. No singing, but we will, uh, no speaking, but we will sing, yes. I commence warming up our voices. My ear tells my throat how to find the key. I always find it. This is one of the reasons why I'm the cantor, the anchoring line. With pitch rooted, the other voices meet it. Step up, step down, two steps up two steps down and back to the middle. Our collective hum joins the unending chorus of loud pinging, knocking, clanging. 
These sounds aren't coming from Brother Silas's hammer, nor the submarine's many machines, which sing their own unending chorus as they work to keep us alive, to keep the boat moving. This is pressure, the weight of the dark sea squeezing the old wells and joints and seals against valves and piping. Our vessel, the Leviathan, its crew, the last of the penitent men on this wicked ruined earth. We scale aft through the mess, through the galley, no victuals, not until later. Hunger reminds us of where we came from, that poisoned, wicked world above, of our salvation. Up past missile control and the radio room, we join the exodus of brothers leaving their stations, follow them through the hatchway, ducking, descending corroded ladders until at last we gather in the missile compartment, our chapel, the largest single space on the Leviathan. We file down the lower deck between the bases of the great red columns, 16 of them, eight spaced parallel on either side. Each is 40 feet tall, reaching from the lowest recesses of the boat to the top deck. Each is wide like the pillars I've imagined, reading the book of Judges, of Samson, and how though his hair was shorn from his head by the betrayer, and though he was powerless and blinded, he still toppled the temple of Dagon. They once held his fire, these pillars, each one. And when he spoke, Kaplan listened, unleashed each, those first days of tribulation. One remains, one missile, the last judgment. The chamber, the whole vessel levels, a litany of bright, high rings told from the brass bell hanging on the main level above. We are at depth, 100 fathoms. Almost all attend the office. We choristers, our fellow brothers, the eight elders, the crew of the Leviathan, those manning the helm, the watch, the radar, those are exempt. Otherwise, when the bell tolls, you abandon your duties, whatever they may be, and there are many, working the bilge pumps, harvesting the mushrooms from the evaporators, mending the nets, pulling in the nets and culling the hull, sick fish from the good fish, less fit, good fish these days, rendering the fats for unguent and fuel, cleaning the battery terminals, draining away the corrosive acid, monitoring the oxygen generator, the CO2 levels, and of course, tending the heart of this beast, the reactor, which always requires a watchful eye, pressure and heat contained in mere piping, poison behind it all, all God's light. Those who tend the reactor, the forgotten, do not come forward for prayers or song either. They are not seen again once they are sent back through the tunnel. They serve their purpose, those forsaken. And we serve ours, we choristers, the five of us who remain, who have not succumbed to the sickness, whose voices have not broken, whose voices still reach the highest, loftiest of ranges. We sing lift the hearts of our brothers. We find God and we call out to him from these depths and he answers. Spoonful of rancid oil, choke it down for our throats, these divine instruments. Elders, most bent, mottled skin, toothless, stand forward, but the younger, broader back brothers space themselves along the walls, between and behind the pillars, against the machinery, against the electronic call consoles that are dead and scavenged for parts long ago. We choristers, we the young, we the ones cut in order to preserve pure voice, gather in the narrow cella before dais and altar and psalter. Kaplan Amida normally leads matins. Kaplan with his stooped frame, his round chin, his eyes that always seem to be closed even when they are open. But he has been absent this past week, ill. His skin <clears throat> was a yellow gray last I saw him. Scant more illumination here in the chapel, skin thin as Bible pages, limbs turned inward, stiff like the already dead. Exo Marston officiates today, steps up to the dais. Tall, too tall for a submariner, some have said of him, which seems to be a truth. He has a hunch for all the years of ducking through hatches. Of the original crew decades ago, head shorn like all of us, hate speckled like an egg. I've seen speckled eggs once blues and pinks and browns, dented his face gaunt, gaunt, scarred by some battle done or some ill deed done to him, look of driftwood, merciless with a strop, exo, especially when it comes to the choristers. We deserve it. We come from wickedness, from topside, rescued, given purpose, a chance to redeem our souls. We aren't the only ones who've been saved. There are those brothers who were taken aboard as children who could not sing but were strong, able, 
and needed to serve on the crew. Like us, they had to earn their place. Many have gone on to take the vows of the Brotherhood, Brother Silas, Brother Callum, but many have not. There cannot be any question of faith, no faltering in our resolve. We must be ready for the day, for it's coming and coming soon. So, that's just that. Atmospheric opening of the uh, of the of, of the book. Um, I uh, I'm going to read a little bit from as I promised before a bit from the cutting room floor. Uh, I was I was discussing this with uh, with Megan and Paul earlier. Um, there exists a version of this book that is unpublished that is twice the length and that is geared toward a young adult audience. I wrote this. It is not published. Uh, it might see the light of day. Who knows? Um, when it came to its choice, I was waiting so long to hear back. From the, from the editor of this of this piece that whenever we heard back I had uh, I had uh, written this other version of the book and so um, but we handed both versions to her and we said would you which one do you think you want and uh, she said you know what I want the small one because she thought it was uh, um, more claustrophobic and a little bit more depressed. And I was like, do we need it to be more claustrophobic? <laughs> and uh, and uh, but yes and I think actually that was kind of a, a right choice but here's a scene um, that I enjoyed very much, and I, I hated very much to have to cut. And so uh, we have a, a, a what it means to go fishing under the water uh, when you're a crew of the submarine of the uh, Leviathan. The missile tube would be wide enough for four choristers to stand shoulder to shoulder in a tight circle, not roomy but tall, forty feet high. The massive length of net is already folded and stored beneath us. I bite down on the hose that will eventually feed me oxygen bitter rubber. I check to make sure my feet fins crafted of oils, oiled skin are strapped securely about my ankles and heels. They help you to swim like a fish. Don't forget, Ephraim says, pointing to his nose. My clamp, the C-shaped piece of metal pinches my nostrils, shut, shut so tight that it bites into my skin, but it will keep the salt water out. I tie the old pair of diver's lenses over my eyes. They've been cracked and have been repaired with gum so many countless times that it's hard to see through them at all, but it is preferable to the burn of water. And now with the missile tube hatch closed and sealed behind us, we're cast into a complete tinny darkness. A hissing resonates, which means the air is being released from the compartment, letting the water flood the tube. My ears pop. It's the moment when the water level rises above your nose, your eyes, when you take in that first oily breath of air being pumped through the rubber hose, when the first wave of fear sets in. But soon we are completely submerged. The water is not cold. It's almost a balmy warmth. We're fishing in the tropical southern waters then. A shrill metallic creaking fills the space. Then the missile door opens to slowly swing, opens slowly swinging open high above. Darkness gives way to a tinted blue crescent of light, and then a full disk of light. I begin swimming up the tube toward that split fragmented light, lugging one end of the bundled netting while Ephraim carries the other. He kicks up fast behind me. He's a strong swimmer. I used to be, but my muscles are still remembering. I struggle to keep pace with him, my tunic and trousers heavy on my body, binding already rubbing against my skin. Muscles unused for so long, tingling. The full-bodied motion of swimming, my body is happy to be flexed and to bend. I push myself. I kick up the full 40 length, um, 40 foot length of the tube toward that light. I bite down on the rubber as I rise. The, the hoses are long. They'll reach the top deck and then some. Up and up. Always blow out breath as you rise. That's what Brother Calvert said. Else you'll get the bends. There will always be enough air in your lungs. Air expands as you ascend. It compresses as you descend. I might not have been taught all there is to know of the sciences. Kaplan only gave me a basic knowledge, but I understand this rule of physic. Every day we hear it, we feel it. The dark water is pressing in, the deeper we sink. But now I am rising. Something in me is growing, trying to get out. And then feeling comes back to me, this freedom, warm, salty water moving past my dry skin. It burns the salt, but in that way that feels good. And then we are through the circular missile door out of darkness and into blue, vast ocean, impossibly big, blue or clear, this watery world. 
or at least 50 fathoms down, yet the light, the sun is bright enough, even obscured to dance in the water, the shimmering point of light above the sun, so near it seems. I read about the churches of old, those stone tall structures with high arched windows that reached up to those very heights, letting shafts of colored light paint a congregation, the penitent. Here, the sea is a cathedral, a vast, never-ending vault of worship. And worship we do, and wait for the fish. Each of us takes their turn with the air hose, a minute of breathing, a minute of holding breath, of waiting. The water has lost some of its warmth. It's the length of time you're exposed. I want to keep my teeth from chattering. They cannot chatter, biting down on the hose. When I'm holding my breath, I must refrain from shivering as best I can. It uses up all the air in the body. Water has begun to pool behind my goggles, not enough to reach my eye yet, but it will happen. And there will be nothing to do for it when it does. Just when it seems we have been out waiting for an eternity, a large undulating shape emerges ahead. One solid object, I think it must be at first, but no, not a single living creature. Hundreds. School of mackerel, their, their silvery skin catching the glint of the sun, shouting out in that dim distance. The school moves in one strange mass above, darting this way and that as our net nears. It scatters in the end, almost half of the school having evaded ensnarement. Even the whole hall would not sustain us for two weeks. Half is even more disappointing. But there's another school ahead. I see the familiar flicker, an undulating blob occasionally flagging, more mackerel perhaps, or herring. And then the shadow crosses over us, enormous, perhaps the sun being obscured by a cloud topside. Ephraim has gripped hold of my arm. He points, but he doesn't need to. All of us are already gazing up. A leviathan passes overhead, a true leviathan, gigantic, almost as long as our boat, it seems, skimming just above the reach of the netting. Not that our netting could ever possibly ensnare it. There might have been a time when Abraham or Aegis would have tried swimming for a harpoon. This has happened before. Not when I was on rigging duty. Brother Calvert told me about it. It took numerous harpoons hooked to numerous lines to finally drag and drown the animal. The meat and fat lasted months. I can almost remember the taste of it. The richness upset my tummy at first. The way my fingers smelled after pulling apart the fatty soft hunks of blubber, putting them in my mouth. But a whale carcass cannot be butchered below the waves. Not in warm waters. The blood draws too many sharks. No, the Leviathan would need to be surfaced and the carcass winched atop the deck. And we do not surface for very long these days. The risk from the topsiders has become too great. Besides, I can't imagine we would ever be able to kill this magnificent creature, this oblong dark mass with bulbous head and fins on its side, the long deep grooves running down the length of its underside, lumps of barnacles speckling it like the boils on Goyne's face. It has seen some violence, our visitor, our friend. Its fin is missing a hunk, and if I'm not wrong, I see a long scar reaching from its back to the underside of its tail. I've never seen one except in the illustrations the Kaplan showed me in one of his books. This close, I can see how such a beast could swallow a man whole. It can't to port to starboard, its massive fluke propelling it forward. I feel the motion of that powerful tail, even down here, a current in the water pushing and then pulling at me. The netting ripples, a few of the fish we have caught find their way free. The Leviathan is hunting the rest of the school that escaped our nets the first time, strange angled mouth hinged wide. This cluster is mostly scattered, but the next one that was headed toward us is gulped down almost in its entirety. Another week's worth, worth of fish stolen from us. But it's hard to be too disappointed, too upset. I only wish Laszlo were here to see it. The whale knows we're down here. It stays with us a time more, more than matching our speed. Perhaps it knows we are watching. Perhaps it is taking the measure of us as well. They are intelligent. That's what the book said. But also, you know it when you listen to them. They communicate, they sing. And now, here, this whale song reaches me, touches my ears and my skin, my whole body. We have heard it from within the hull of the ship, but not outside in the open water. How are my ears still hearing it? A resonance high and shrill, haunting. I recognize this song, this wail, the way its sound bends, even muffled by the water, the litany of clicks and odd groans that follow. This is Hildegard. 
At most, we've only ever heard two of them swimming together. I read that they usually travel in pods, but not these two. Maybe we're the only family we use sing. But where is the other? Why is this one traveling alone, Hildegard? It's as though the whale has been reading my mind. For now, it swims away in another direction, perhaps to find Barnabas. Yes, Hildegard. Her song rings so, rings so familiar to me. I don't even know if she's a she. It's just something about the quality of her song. So just because I, uh, you know, this, this, uh, my, my first book came out a couple of years ago and, uh, um, of course, I've been working ever since on new material, and whenever I find an opportunity like this to be able to uh, to share some of that, I get very excited. So um, I thought I would share a little bit tonight of the opening pages of a new novella that is, is not published yet. Um, it's called A Glorious Age of Permanence. It's another uh, speculative fiction piece, another alternative history piece that's sort of my jam. I like to re-examine the past in certain ways. Uh, this one, as a matter of fact, is set in my hometown of Waco, Texas, um, uh, in 1950, uh, in 1954, a year after the great tornado of Waco destroyed half the, the city, um, my, my grandparents uh, survived that, that tornado barely. And, and, and a little bit as an homage to my grandmother, the, uh, the protagonist of this piece, is her name is Alma. So that's my grandmother's name. So this is just a bit from the new piece, A Glorious Age of Permanence. I should say, uh, also, just to give you a little bit of an update on the speculative elements of it, um, it's, okay, so we're in the year um, 19, 1954, uh, so my twist here is that um, in 19, uh, 50 years earlier than, so Dolly the Sheep was cloned by, uh, by the Scottish in, in 1996, so I'm presupposing that uh, maybe they did that sooner and other cloning technologies sort of fall. So that's sort of the twist, sci-fi twist here. <clears throat> As to the events that occurred on the evening of April 18th, 1954, Waco, Texas, the third floor of the Alaco building, the law offices of Dukin and Cobb, Alma could attest to little. She had left the office at a quarter past five. It was the last business day of the quarter, so she was sure to file the inventory log for the month's transactions. Mr. Louis Dugan Esquire was still wedged in his leather roll chair. It wasn't in any way odd that Mr. Dugan was staying on a little late. He had his own paperwork to true up for the quarter in report. Nor was it odd that he was already working on his second glass of Kentucky Brown by the time she said her goodbye, her good evenings and see you in the AM. It was a sort of ritual at his quarter end, especially since Nanette left him. Nor was it in any way peculiar that Martha was still seated dutifully at her desk just outside of Mr. Dugan's office. It always made sense to have a stimio on hand. The boss was still working. Had he said anything odd? Was he acting strangely? No, not for two bourbons in. If anything, he seemed more ebullient than he normally would be at a quarter end. He'd already eaten half of his dinner, a hamburger sandwich sent over from Kim's. He never ate right. Last Alma saw him, she had helped him clean a dab of ketchup off his collar of tissue. He smelled vaguely of his liquor, of onions and palm oils and aquafalfa, and then a smile and even now Alma, a warm touch on the wrist. That's what Alma tells Sheriff Hilbert now seated on the Naga Hyde sofa in the reception area, not looking, willing herself not to look at the covered shape on the floor beside her. A plum jelly stain has reached beyond the breadth of the sheet and it has spread its sticky fingers into the carpet, inevitable as a grim tide. Stain has had it all night to set, so there would be little luck in shifting it at this point. Poor Martha, all night lying there dead. Not, not that she would know the difference between one dead hour or nine dead hours of her stain. And how long it had taken for her to die. It was quick, all the homes. The emergency services had seen to Mr. Cobb since he was still breathing. He thought to cinch his leg with a belt. Lasted all night. When Alma unlocked the office door this morning, she was met with that abattoir smell and sulfur. Three rounds had been fired. Mr. Dugan's gun. They found it on the carpet next to Mr. Cobb. And Mr. Cobb, Ethan, skin gray, out cold, wheezing like an asthmatic. Quite a thing, all this, quite a thing. But the coroner has not yet been allowed to fetch Martha. The company needs to evaluate its lost property first. 
These are the explicit, explicit rules laid out when Alma herself made the call to the Doyle group. Martha wasn't to be moved. An agent would be there within a few hours. Sorry, can't be any sooner. They're going to have to drive down from Dallas. And Mr. Cobb, where did he show up? Elbert asks, jotting down notes with the nubby number two onto one of the napkins that had come with Mr. Dukin's dinner the night before. He must have come in later. He left for the, he left for the day at lunch, uh, said he was meeting with a potential client. He doesn't often come back to the office after a long lunch meeting. He'd have to swim. She immediately feels a pang of guilt for saying it. How is, how is he? She asks. He made it to the hospital. Hasn't woken up since I got here. Might not. Lost a lot of blood. Yes, that much is evident based on the stain on the patch of carpet in Dugan's office before his great cherry wood desk. The rich burgundy stain, not so large as the one blooming beneath Martha's fallen form. Large. You don't really think it, you don't really think it could be him that's to blame, she says. Mr. Dugan. Hilbert doesn't look directly at her, nor at her bosom, which is where his eyes would normally drift when he stopped by on county business, which was frequent enough. Got to do the investigation proper, you know. Ever what happens here? Well, it raises suspicion. We went by his place this morning. It looks like he cleared out of here in a hurry. Hill scratches his scalp with the eraser eraserless metal cuff of the pencil, squints at his nose. Same look as when he sat down for an algebra test back in high school, as though willing, through concentration on the page, the correct answer to magically appear. Anything else here might be missing you know of, Hill asks. You take a look around, might be helpful. No, she says. The Smithfield is pretty much the only thing that's worth anything around here. The vellum stock, but you can't brand that without the Smithfield, and every Smithfield requires a unique signature, so it's not like just anyone could use it. Other than that, whatever was in Mr. Dugan's safe. And what was in there? I don't have the combination, the payroll, of course. I believe I saw some other documents, sealed in envelopes. I'm sure some personal effects, a few stacks of cash, travel, travel documents. She doesn't tell Hill this, not that he would be, not that that would be odd either. Dugan and Cobb started as a bonding company after all. Still had clients, still had clients in that regard. They had to have some cash on hand. Thank you, Alma, I'll holler back, he says, touching the brim of his hat, wiping his large red porous nose with the back of his hand. I just don't think Lewis could do this, so Alma says, attempting restraint to mask that flood already roaring within her. Something had to have happened to him. It can't have been him. He's missing. You need to try to find him. He looks down at his scuffed boots. Shit, Alma. You know we are. He steps a little closer, head down so that the brim of his hat doesn't edge her. I don't want to think it either, but the truth is, Cobb was waking up this morning to point the finger, and the gun sort of, well, it speaks for itself. What with the prints on it? The sheriff opens his hands, an unspoken truth hangs between them. I'll ring in later. What about her, she asks, looking to the shrouded body of Martha left lying there on the floor. He sucks air through his teeth. You said it, can't move her, not till the company man comes. But she's right there by my desk. Don't suspect you'll be doing much work for that, uh, for a bit of anything. Till things get figured out, you might want to just go on. Oh, I don't think so, there's too much to be done. Hillerbert pauses. Is there? She smooths her silk blouse. Still a business, a business of law. Right, he answers in a way that raises her hackles. Use the desk back there in the bullpen. We come through them all already. The phones had been clanging like alarms all morning. And even though it wasn't either her or Alice's job to answer the phones, that task was often assigned to Martha or to Janine. But Janine took one step into the office that morning and had to rush out to the curb to be sick and didn't return. So, to work. Appointments had to be moved, if not canceled outright. Clients would eventually have to be informed. They were a law firm, after all. And what did that mean? Surety, fidelity. Values that are more important now than ever. She feels it every time she switches on the Smithfield. Twice the size of a standard Corona and twice the weight. The hum of the electronic elements warming up like a vacuum tube radio. The ozone smell, the tang of warm oil. And then the snap of the red hot type head striking the sheet of vellum parch, branding into that special tanned treated hides, letters, writs, contracts, banking documents, deeds. Oh, and then the aroma of the branded parch itself, redolent and pleasant as childhood. Her father scored leather in his workshop when she was a kid. No, sweeter than that, something humbler than that. And to know a half world away, a scroll of virgin parch sat sealed, dated waiting to be received. 
She'd seen the process happen herself in her training week for the Doyle group. The receiving parts was sealed between two pieces of glass, so there could be no question as to the process's authenticity and functionality. It was something like magic, watching the words appear one letter at a time, emerging from that starchy, pure whiteness, meaning, surety, promise, all of it coming into existence. Parch, Smithfields, Marthas, tuning clamps, the scientific principle called entanglement that allowed for all of these things to be possible. What a glorious age of discovery of technology to be living in. Herb had never understood it. Alma's fascination, her dedication to it all. The last thing he said to her that morning in the kitchen before the tornado took him was, why even bother? No, he could never understand it. The thrill. And then the final moment when the documentation is completed, the hot coil signatures, that final stroke of authority pressing her electric seal into it as verification, a seal not just anyone had the authority to wield. No, Alma is special. She's known it since she first started working for Mr. Dugan as a licensed Doyle Group notary, a controller of quality, of exactitude, of truth, in an age of permanence. What could matter more? So um, I know that um, when I was in my MFA uh, and going to many readings a week, I always appreciated it uh, whenever um, the readings were short and somewhat sweet. Though. So that's really all I have uh, prepared for you tonight. It was really my pleasure to share a bit from We Shall Sing a Song and uh, uh, from the cutting room floor, which is always, I think, an important aspect of the writing process. We have to remember uh, so many of our darlings get cut and, and sifted. And then, of course, the new piece, uh, which hopefully I uh, will find its way into the world soon. So, yes. so uh, if you want to pick up a copy, and you know you do, if you don't have one already, or get your copy signed, we're going to hang out here for a little bit. And then if you're interested in uh, participating in a Q&A with Andy, we're going to go straight across the hallway in about 10 or so minutes to, what room are we in? 408, my students? Yes. Okay. Good thing they're here. <laughs> uh, thank you all again for being here and get home safely. Yes, <laughs> 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 <laughs>